Good morning. Before we start, I want to make a couple observations. First, it is an extraordinary day in our nation because the vaccine is being administered to our first frontline healthcare workers. Uh, it's a real milestone, it's a turning point, but I want to underscore that even as now we can see a glimmer of light at the end of this very dark tunnel, we have to recognize that it's more important than ever with our nation nearing 300,000 deaths attributed to COVID to follow the directions of our healthcare professionals who among other things are saying to us when we are in public, we must wear our masks. When we are in public, we must, must socially distance ourselves from each other. Now is not the time to let our guard down. We can celebrate this remarkable achievement while at the same time doing everything we can to protect our community, our families, and ourselves. I want to also observe that today is the eighth year since the Sandy Hook massacre. Eight years. Uh, we have continued to see a, an, uh, an epidemic of gun violence since that tragedy occurred and so many children and others were slaughtered. I, I want to note that in those eight years, not only have thousands of, pe of people died because of gun violence, but it's also the case that in cities around the nation now, we are seeing an increase in gun violence. We're seeing it in urban centers across the country, and we're seeing it here in Los Angeles, in particular in South Los Angeles. We must do more. And I'm gonna have much more to say about further steps we can take, not only here, but as a nation in the days to come with a new administration in Washington. But for today, let's underscore that we need to combat all aspects of our public health and public safety epidemic of gun violence. We have to do it by combating the ever increasing threat from ghost guns. We have to do that by making sure we're vigilant in enforcing our rules regarding the safe storage of guns. We have to do it by keeping guns away from criminals and kids. We have to do it by assuring that people who are suffering from episodes of mental illness or have our domestic abusers don't have their hands on guns. There's much more that we should be doing as a nation, and there's more we can do, each of us in our communities. Again, more to come on that soon. But we're here today to talk about something else altogether. I wanna talk about the effort our office continues to undertake to make our neighborhoods safe and improve the quality of life in every neighborhood in our community. When I became city attorney, I emphasized the importance of our neighborhoods and keeping them safe and assuring that people thrive in those neighborhoods. As you know, I indicated we would double our neighborhood prosecutor program when I ran for office and we've more than tripled that program that embeds key members of my office in neighborhoods throughout Los Angeles, not only to be traditional prosecutors, but also to be community problem solvers. In addition, of course, we have our neighborhood justice program, which emphasizes criminal justice reform in ways that make neighborhoods safer, engage neighbors in those issues, and turns the lives of offenders around with a remarkably low 5% rate of repeat offenses. Um, and we've done it through other programs that focus on school safety and more. Today, I want to announce the filing of a lawsuit by another team in our office that focuses on safety and quality of life in our neighborhoods. And that's our community, our citywide nuisance abatement program, our CNAP program, uh, which does a remarkable job of targeting properties that are the sources of violence and other public safety issues in neighborhoods. Uh, I want to note that since I've become city attorney, our citywide nuisance abatement team has filed 146 nuisance abatement lawsuits, obtained 309 injunctions, and secured more than two and a half million dollars in penalties. It's a remarkable team doing incredibly important work about what, which I hear compliments from people who live in neighborhoods where they work all the time. Today I'm announcing we filed a lawsuit against the owners and operator of an alleged unlicensed underground nightclub 
that we allege is being run out of a storefront in the downtown fashion district area. We allege it's being run without any of the required permits and licenses and in defiance of the mandatory COVID-19 public health restrictions that we're all living under. This is advertised on social media as a secret club. It's advertised as LA Party Society. It's allegedly the site of numerous shootings and assaults and violence. And our lawsuit seeks to permanently shut it down. Uh, we allege this club is a hub of violence and crime and that that violence and crime spills out into the streets in the surrounding community and puts everyone in that neighborhood at increased risk. Because beyond the bullets and the assaults and the other criminal activity, I want to emphasize that packing people into an indoor space, an unlicensed nightclub during the pandemic is the height of irresponsibility. I mean, that's why licensed clubs are forbidden to operate. And here we allege it's an unlicensed club. We're suing Frontier Holdings Inc. LLC, e, e, pardon me, Frontier Holdings East LLC and Regal Group LLC. Um, they each have an ownership interest in the property, we allege, and it's managed by uh, a man named David Taban, who's a real estate investor with dozens of properties and is currently being prosecuted in two separate criminal actions, uh, one of which is the alleged operation of an illegal marijuana dispensary next door. Another defendant is uh, Yves uh, Oscar Jr., He's a tenant and the operator, we allege, of LA Party Society. Uh, he was arrested in August in front of the club for an outstanding warrant tied to an alleged sexual assault. This location is advertised as a secret club on Instagram and other social media platforms. It's alleged to offer pole dancing, music, hookah, live performances, and a full bar. See, the storefront within which this operates appears to be closed but patrons enter the club through the back. They enter through a gated parking lot that's also controlled by the operators of the club, we allege. There's a large LA Party Society mural that covers almost the entire wall of the property um, in the from, seen from the parking lot. Over the past few months, despite public health orders aimed at stemming the pandemic, we allege the nightclub has operated and been the site, as I said, of violence, uh, violence that spills out in the community. Among the alleged recent incidents are these. On September 4th, we allege a security guard was shot while breaking up a fight with two club goers who flashed guns and fired multiple shots uh, with one allegedly yelling rolling, rolling 60s neighborhood before taking off. On August 16th, a patron was physically assaulted inside the club after confronting a man who stole her phone. On August 8th, a patron leaving the club was pistol whipped and robbed at gunpoint by two men in the alley behind the club. As the victim fled, one of the muggers pointed a gun at him and fired. On August 7th, a patron inside the club was accused of selling ex uh, fake ecstasy and was punched and kicked in the face by three men uh, who beat him severely outside the club. He had to go to the emergency room. July 16th, a shootout involving three different guns with shots fired to and from cl the club's parking lot and into the alley took place. Uh, one bullet struck a bouncer in the neck and another bullet hit a second victim in the leg. With all this activity happening in this one location in our fashion district, we are seeking to permanently have this location declared a public nuisance and shut down. We want to prevent the defendants from using this property in the future for a nightclub or any other unlawful purpose, and we're seeking civil penalties and fees from the defendants. Um, I want to thank, as I always do, our friends at LA City View Channel 35 for carrying this today. I want to thank Arlene Navarez, who is here, Navarez, who is here today. She's doing a great job, as always. Um, can I ask you to say complimentary things about yourself as we do that? Is that okay? In any event, we appreciate your work. I want to say a few words in Spanish, and then I'm happy to take questions. And uh, Rob Wilcox is available to take questions from anybody who wishes to offer them. Ahora en español. Hoy quiero anunciar que presentamos una demanda contra la, los propietarios y el operador de un supuesto club nocturno subterráneo sin licencia. Este sitio 
está detrás de lo que aparenta ser una tienda normal en el distrito de la moda del centro de la ciudad. Este negocio está operando sin ninguno de los permisos o licencias requeridos y en contra de las restricciones de salud pública obligatorios de COVID-19. El sitio está anunciando en las redes sociales como un club secreto, LA Party Society. Supuestamente es el sitio de numerosos tiroteos, asaltos, uh, venta de drogas y violencia. Nuestra demanda busca cerrarlo permanentemente. Alegamos que este club nocturno es un centro de violencia y crimen que se derrama a la calle y pone en riesgo a todos los miembros de la comunidad uh, circundante. Aparte de las balas, los asaltos, la venta de drogas, meter sobrepasar la capacidad de, uh, de gente en un club nocturno sin licencia durante la pandemia es terriblemente irresponsable. Es por eso que los clubes o, o centros nocturnos con licencias están cerrados en este momento. Gracias. All right, a question from Chris and Carlo from KFI AM 640. Why not just have the LAPD shut down the club? Why is a lawsuit needed? Thank you, Chris. Uh, we've been in communication, obviously, with our partners at LAPD, um, including regarding the possibility of shutting off the power at this location. Um, LAPD, as you know, is a close partner with us in providing us with the underlying information about criminal activity at locations like this. This lawsuit is imperative because we can permanently shut down the location in ways that mere arrests cannot achieve. Uh, but as I say, in the meantime, we're working with LAPD in the possibility of a water and power shutoff. From Lolita Lopez at NBC4. Has your office heard or experienced other similar underground clubs and or businesses violating the safer at home orders? Has enforcement stepped up during the pandemic in response, response and in what ways? Hi, Lolita. Thanks for the question. So I, I'm not going to discuss uh, other, what, uh, maybe other investigations that are ongoing, but I can say this. There's a statewide concern about clubs operating during the pandemic. And we know that that's an issue. On the one hand, our office has, as you know, focused on party, party houses because those locations can be super spreader events. And again and again, we've dealt with them, especially in the Hollywood Hills. When it comes to clubs, irrespective of their specific locations in the city, I want to say that if our office is referred any matter about which there could be a potentially unlawful gathering at an indoor location like one of these clubs, we're going to go after him, but I can't say anything specific beyond what we're doing regarding this club today. From Lila Seidman from the Los Angeles Times, why is the suit coming now? It seems the city knew about events happening three months ago when COVID-19 orders prohibiting nightclubs from operating were still in place. Fair enough. So we were aware of the violent activity fairly recently. That violent activity also was accompanied by information to us that there was a club in that location. So we've, we've acted, we filed our lawsuit uh, within the past couple weeks. We acted as soon as we had enough information to substantiate the allegations in our lawsuit. Um, as I say, we're working with our partners at, at the department, uh, the police department now, uh, regarding the potential for a power shutoff there. But we, we filed this lawsuit um, when we had enough information to assure that our civil litigation had a strong basis. And again, this litigation is designed to permanently, not temporarily, permanently shut down the location. And the next question from Stephanie Bradford from Univision. What is the city's plan to enforce the prohibition of parties that have become such a focus of the pandemic? Well, Stephanie, thank you for the question. As, as I mentioned, uh, our office does receive referrals about party locations, um, and our plan is as it has been. 
which is when we are referred information about an alleged party location, uh, we will work with our partners at LAPD. In the first instance, LAPD, may, working with the mayor's office and the Department of Water and Power, may end up shutting down power at those locations. We may also have criminal cases that arise from those locations. In some cases, like this one, uh, we may file civil litigation. So our plan, we're working on many different levels, but I want to underscore the point that because these parties can be super spreader events, because we have seen unprecedented levels of the infection spreading in recent days, this is a key priority for us. As soon as we get a referral from an investigative agency, we're acting. From Craig Figner, KNX 1070 News Radio, are the two people you mentioned or anyone else in custody regarding this nuisance lawsuit? No, this is a civil, this is a piece of civil litigation, so uh, it's not a criminal action. People aren't in custody. This is a civil lawsuit. Our citywide nuisance abatement program is unique in that it relies on underlying information from our law enforcement partners, but those, that information provides the basis for civil lawsuits. So no, no one is in custody, but these allegations are very serious, and we are acting uh, with them as fast as we can. Thank you. That concludes our questioning for today. Thank you all very much for attending today's conference. I really appreciate it. Stay healthy and stay safe. Take care.